Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Becker with RedmondMag.com, and I'd like to thank you all for joining today's webcast. Today, we're talking about navigating your hybrid workplace strategy with Microsoft Teams and BlueJeans. The event is sponsored by BlueJeans. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a couple of uh, housekeeping details. BlueJeans has provided several resources, which can be found on the right-hand side of your console, so please take a moment to check those out. Also, the webcast is being recorded, so keep an eye out for a link in your email to rewatch the presentation or share with a colleague. So for the next hour, we're going to have a conversation about what the future of work in this hybrid environment is going to look like and some of the best ways to enable collaboration and meetings in those settings. So for the agenda, I'll start the conversation with an overview of some brand new survey-based research that we did here for Redmond Magazine. And then we'll move into a roundtable discussion with our guests. So first, we've got Randy Chapman. Randy is a consultant, blogger, and podcaster, and a Microsoft MVP for Teams. So he specializes in telephony, meetings, and collaboration. He's a modern workplace architect and head product um, head of product at Simity. That's S Y M I T Y. Uh, dot com, and he helps global customers with their digital transformation and UC journey. And in his spare time, he's a blogger and podcaster at ucstatus.com, a conference co-organizer, a YouTuber, and a public speaker. Our other guest today is Zach Boson. He's Vice President for Product Marketing and Communications at BlueJeans. He's responsible for shaping and executing the go-to market strategy for BlueJeans award-winning meetings platform. He was most recently Director of Solutions Marketing at Veritas, and he's also been an analyst in a previous life at the member-based advisory company CEB, which is now part of Gartner. So it's going to be a great discussion, and then there will be a Q&A. So keep your fingers limber to type in those questions in the questions. So the first thing, as I, as I said, what I want to go through quickly is, uh, is a preview of some research that we did. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, the COVID-19 pandemic caused a massive shift in the way IT supported employees. And it happens that, that we just have some, uh, a new research report from Redmond Intelligence um, that really makes it look like, you know, the effects will last well beyond the, the current pandemic. So it's a great setup for our conversation today about, about hybrid work. Uh, just real quickly about Redmond Intelligence. It's the research arm of the Converge 360 Media Group, which includes Redmond Mag. Uh, and we surveyed 436 IT professionals and managers in the first quarter of this year uh, from organizations of all sizes, from small and medium-sized businesses all the way up to, to global enterprises. Mostly, uh, most of the respondents were in the, in the U.S. So I just want to go to... Uh, the headline change here um, over on the left, it, it, it was in the percentage of employees at organizations who worked at home prior to the outbreak of the pandemic compared to how many were working at home nearly a year later. You know, so so prior to the outbreak, 71% uh, of respondents said that 80% or more of their workforce was in an office. So I, I know that's a lot of percentages in, in, one, in one thing. But in other words, at the vast majority of organizations, at least four out of five employees worked in the office. So fast forward to now, you know, during the pandemic and the numbers are completely flipped. So you've got only 19% of respondents still had at least four out of five employees in the office. And I, I know the numbers there on the, on the uh, right uh, in the donut are pretty small, but I just want to point you to uh, that, that sort of southeast edge of the donut there. It's like a light blue or aqua color. And that's that's the percentage of companies where 91 to 100 percent of their workers are at home now, and that's that's almost 28 percent, which is just, I don't know, it's a, it's like a mind-boggling number. You know, if you if you came out with that number in, in 2018 or 2019, it would be crazy. Um, so, you know, IT managers and uh, and professionals are are also expecting the effects of that headlong rush to to remote work to to sort of echo into the future. So I want to look at one thing first. A plurality um, of 35 percent expected that if you know vaccines and other methods get the pandemic under control, it brings some workers back, leave others at home, and rely more on flexible shared workspaces. You know, and so you know I, I, that was just like you know that's the biggest group there where it's really going to be you know kind of playing it by ear and bringing bringing a lot of people back. Um, and we'll go into some of those other numbers a little bit more um, in a minute. But the the other one was that that nearly a third expect physical office space to decline at their organizations in the future. Um, and and uh, in in about a quarter 
expect a reduction in on-premises data center capacity as well, which is a little bit outside the scope um, of what we're talking about today, but it's, I also found it interesting. Um, but I'll leave this slide up because while the organizations, you know, that are that are looking to shake things up make up a sizable group, there are a lot of organizations that anticipate getting back to the way things were. They kind of want to snap back, you know. So on various questions, 30% told us that, uh, you know, they'd be bringing most workers who were previously in the office back to the office. 50% plan to keep office space the same or increase it, uh, which is, you know, which you can which you can see here. Um, and uh, in the, in 50%, a couple of them add up. The, the biggest one is keeping the office space the same. Some, some were um, adding some. And then 48% wanted to maintain or increase on-premises data center capacity. But what, what's also interesting is, is just there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. So if you're not sure what you're going to do, you're, you're far from alone. Um, on the office space question, 19% didn't know or they hadn't decided what, what they were going to do. On the data center size in question, 27% hadn't def decided. Um, you know, in, in, I'll just give an anecdote from my own company. Um, and maybe I'm speaking a little bit out of school because we, we had a company meeting about this yesterday. But, you know, I've been in a home office for 23 years. So th there's a lot of us, you know, at, at my company at 1105 Media who were at home. Um, but then, you know, we've got one office where, you know, they were looking at the at the lease and they decided not to renew. So all those employees, you know, in in one city, it, it was working out really well with them all at home. So they're gonna they're gonna stay home and shut down that office. Uh, the rest of the company in the in the larger offices, they'll be coming back, you know, in July. Um, you know, we've got a we've got a firm date for them for them to come back. So it's just it's a real mix, you know, and and I, and I think it's a it's a it's a good um, you know example of of what a, a lot of people were reporting in, in our survey here, which is just that. It's a very mixed bag, but it's it's sort of bending toward a, a new equilibrium with a, a lot more people remote than before. Nothing absolute one way or the other, but kind of kind of a, a shift. Um, and then one last thing that I wanted to show you before we get on to our, our panel discussion here uh, with, with Zach and Randy, but um, you know, if there was any doubt about um, you know, virtual meetings and video conferencing and, and how important they've become. You know, this is sort of a, a master of the obvious question, but, you know, it's it's just, it's interesting. Um, the, the, I think the slide puts it to rest. So we asked, what technologies became more important as your organization responded to the topic, I mean, to the pandemic? And clearly the top item is virtual meeting and, and video conferencing. Some of the other top ones you would expect, VPN, upgraded laptops, remote support, et cetera. But uh, virtual meeting and video conferencing obviously is a huge one. So with that, um, I want to move on to our panel discussion and and bring in Zach and Randy. Guys, uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we all talk about hybrid workplace a lot. Um, you know, and, and it's always good to level set in this sort of uh, in this sort of uh, you know conversation. So maybe Randy, I'll, I'll go to you first. Can you give me a, a specific definition of the hybrid work workplace from from your perspective? Yeah, sure. So I mean, I, I, I mean the numbers that you that you showed were you know, no real surprise. Um, the only one big surprise was that seventy one percent were in in offices before the pandemic and. And I thought it would be a lot higher, particularly in the U.S. Um, you know, I know a lot of people that do work from home, you know, as a as a thing. You said 23 years. Me, myself, I'm kind of seven or eight years now. Uh, and I know a lot of other people, you know, that are similar to me in their job roles that, that work from home or, you know, full time or at least part time. So that, that mm -hmm. number really uh, surprised me. But really hybrid is, you know, is just that is is is, you know, you're you're not permanently based necessarily at any one location. You are, I guess, transient, a little bit nomad. You could be in an office, you could be at a customer site, you could be at home, you could be, you know, I mean, before the pandemic, I was all over the place, you know, I had conference calls and teams meetings and in train stations, plane, you know, sort of um, not, not actually on the plane, but, you know, sitting there waiting for the actual, you know, the, the, the gate to call and stuff. So hybrid is is just being everywhere, really, and just working wherever you happen to be. Um, that's that's my kind of takeaway from it. Great. Uh, Zach? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's 
it, it's less about the physical aspect and more about the mindset. And I think it's about a mindset that embraces flexibility. And so historically, you know, from a manager's perspective, you know, the orientation is, you know, a legacy approach is if my people are, at, you know, they're in the office, they're working. And so I think yeah. it, you know, moving more to a hybrid model is about embracing that flexibility where, and, you know, having that trust that everyone has gained over the past year. And, you know, as people start to think, hey, you know, there's aspects to the office that are advantageous. I want to take advantage of those that, that we don't retreat back to the legacy mindset, which is, oh, everyone, if we have a couple people in the office, everyone needs to be in the office. We need to adapt how we think about where work gets done. And so I think a lot of the kind of questions people have is like, how do we make that shift? How do we make that pivot into that mindset where flexibility uh, kind of reigns supreme? And we adopt that throughout all the different aspects of our, our business and, and how we get work done. Uh, and so I think hybrid to me really is that kind of, you know, flipping the script on, on where work gets done and how we think about how work gets done. Great. Yep. So um, it, as far as, you know, some of the trends that you're anticipating that organizations are going to be facing as we head into the summer, um, maybe Zach, I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. What, what do you mm -hmm. see coming? Well, like fingers crossed, people feel you know comfortable going back into offices uh, to a certain degree. Um, that's what I'm really hopeful for. I, I think that what we're going to see is kind of this evolution of of kind of policies being set. And I think you have some of the larger tech companies who are trying to get out there and say, hey, you know, our, our folks are going to be mandated to come in the office three days a week. And then you have other companies who are saying, hey, we're going to leave it up to the individual management teams to make decisions about, you know, the, the type of uh, kind of requirements we're going to have. And then you have some companies, maybe those in the financial services sector, who are saying, hey, everyone's coming back in just like beforehand. So I think one of the, the top trends that it'll be important to pay attention to is, you know, are those policies being set? You know, is, is confidence kind of growing that we need to have policies in place? I think one of the, you know, the, the challenges is that if organizational leaders say we're not going to set a policy, then it's going to be very ambiguous. And I think that, you know, we, leaders need to provide some kind of guidance uh, towards what the expectation is. So kind of employees don't feel like they're out in the lurch. Is it okay for me to stay working from home for a couple of days? You know, is it, do I need to go in the office? Is there a big team meeting? Um, so I think, you know, one of the interesting trends to then to watch is the evolution of those policies. And once they're kind of solidified, then the adoption of them. Um, so I think, mm -hmm. you know, that that's, that's one critical one that I'm watching. Uh, and then another one is just kind of the evolution of the office space. And I think if you uh, think about offices that we're all familiar with, there's kind of workstations that have been assigned to people uh, in a traditional office and you have conference rooms. Maybe you have like a break space, lunch space, things like that. Well, if kind of organizations want to bring people back into the office for specific activities that are maybe more collaborative, you know, how are we going to be redesigning those spaces? You know, how are we going to be thinking about the best work that can happen in those spaces? How do we technology enable those spaces um, and see what kind of cool new ideas and innovations are going to be coming uh, out of kind of the, the pandemic uh, where people are excited to get back together. Um, but how are you going to create those environments to kind of be attractive to people to come into the office? Because everyone likes working from home. Everyone likes likes not having to commute. Um, so it'll be interesting to see then how not only the policy gets set, but then how organizations adapt their office space uh, to be more welcoming to whatever this next generation of work looks like. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Randy, anything to, uh, to add on that? Some of the, any, you know, trends that you're, you're anticipating? Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned the mindset. Obviously, you have two mindsets. You got mindset of the employer who always had that expectation that you're in the office. I can see you, therefore you're productive and busy. And you got the mindset of the of the employee who was probably sent home for the first time. You know, mm -hmm. um, and you know those those numbers that you showed, nineteen percent are still in the office. And I guess those are the people that are. They have to be because of whatever they do, the function they do just can't be done remotely or, or from home. So, you know, all these people have to try and find a place in their house to work and, 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 you know, probably adapt their whole lives. You know, sometimes when their kids are sent home, they become the teacher as well as an employee of a company is, and, and, and all that sort of thing. So, 
Yeah, I, it's interesting because, you know, here in the UK, it's a little different to the US. The, the government said it's locked down and therefore everybody's locked down. All the shops are shut. All the buildings are shut. Everybody was sent home and everybody had to just, there was no argument. You just had to go home. Restaurants and things like that are, are the exception to that, but, you know, particularly those that can do takeaways, but everything else was shut and really nobody had a choice. And for the last, I'd say, six months, everybody's been working on work, you know, sort of uh, working on strategies to try and bring people back to the office safely. None of them are, are well, as far as I could tell, none of them are going back to the, the old ways of, you know, this is Zach's desk over here in the corner. That's where Zach has always sat. It's going to be a mm -hmm. case of now we have, you know, 400 desks in this in this building because of social distancing. You know, we need to have that or even third that and really try and identify the, the spaces we can allow people to safely return and also then adapt the technology to you know find a desk to report that you you're you're um, free of of covid and things like that maybe you've had a test recently you don't have a fever when you're going in adhering to t's and c's and things and then actually safely going back in and you know Every business I've spoken to is also reducing the amount of time they're allowing people to come back to the office. You know, some some are, you know, making it as as little as as one to two days. You know, you're not allowed to come into the office for more than one to two days in a given week, and and even then, they're even restricting the amount of time. You're only allowed, you know, for that for eight hours unless you have some specific thing. Uh, so everybody's adapting to it. You're know, not just the employer, the employee, the whole workspace, as you said, is, is adapting. And, you know, in the meeting spaces um, business where I work at Simity, there's there's businesses that are asking for meetings and, and uh, trying to help, you know, for to ask for help actually designing the hybrid meeting room, you know, to try and um, take spaces that weren't meeting rooms before, make them meeting rooms, maximize the effort, you know, to try and to make sure that that they can include people that are happen to be in the office and everybody that's 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 at home and and you know and remote and trying to bring everybody together. So things like, you know, the magic whiteboard will really come back to to fray for Teams rooms and just, you know, all the A V is just going to be stepped up. It's just a really busy time in the meeting spaces business. And, you know, I think even even CVI technologies such as blue jeans could could potentially you know sort of be a big game changer there as well bringing you know not just your employees that use the same system as you but also bringing people that that are using whatever so everybody can meet safely it's it's really interesting that's a great point and i wonder if you could give us a quick definition of of CVI um just for those of us who aren't in the space every day Okay, I can, I take, can that. take that. So, or, or, you can, you can, or you can, can take, take that. Yeah, <laughs> no, you're, you're the yeah, MVP. You can do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's it's cloud video interop or CVI. Um, effectively, what that means is it's a um, I call it a virtual meeting room or a virtual meeting space that that uh, is there to translate all the different meeting platforms into a common into a common platform. Not everybody's using Teams, unfortunately. If you're not, go get Teams. Um, but, you know, there's people out there with legacy systems. I'll call them legacy systems. You know, some people say, no, it's current systems. It's Cisco or it's Aruba or it's, you know, whatever. And they all need to meet, to be able to meet sometimes. And, it, you know, it means that you can get your 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 own legacy equipment or invite your, your customers with their own legacy equipment into your Teams meetings in, and, and meet in a common and common ground. And it's it's a great technology. Zach, do you have you anything guys, to add to that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, no, Zach. I mean, I would know it's a great job. Uh, yeah, cloud yeah. video interop <laughs> really is, you know, and, and I think Randy's talking about those kind of standards-based endpoints, you know, H.323 and SIP-based endpoints. There's yeah. millions of them out in the world, and they need to connect to Microsoft Teams meetings. And so cloud video interop is that technology, that middleware that stitches together those legacy endpoints and allows them to join those Teams meetings. And uh, very critical. We, you know, teams adoption is uh, something like unlike we've we've ever seen. Uh, and I think you know the pandemic has has driven that, but also just all the functionality that's built into that productivity hub. Uh, and so what, one of the interesting topics is you know everyone that is a Teams user today, but using it from home, 
when those folks do come back into the office, you want to ensure that your, your workspaces are enabled to maintain that continuity. Uh, because if that's the way everyone has now adapted, you don't want to take that away from people. You want to help enable that, whether they're at home or in the office. And I think that's central to this conversation about hybrid is, is how do you create that continuity? How do you create that consistency? And if, if people feel like they're being more productive, well, the last thing a business wants to do is take away uh, you know, those productivity gains. And so I think there's some interesting yeah. questions there. Right. You know, and, and both of you mentioned something that, that really piqued my interest, which is, you know, what do you see being so close to the space as far as, you know, in, in office space construction? You know, what's going on right now in, in terms of, you know, people, you know, re-architecting their offices or, you know, or getting new spaces? You know, is it, you know, just fewer desks farther, you know, spaced farther apart and sort of traditional conference rooms? Are there new types of rooms that are coming up or, or those things that you think are going to develop over the next few years and, and haven't really emerged yet? Like, what's the space look like? That's a, that's a great question. You know, sort of the traditional meeting room is still, you know, very much king all the way from, you know, small round tables or even just, you know, video booths, you know, kind of, kind of things for, for just getting some privacy and doing a video meeting mm -hmm. all the way through to large, boardrooms or multi-use spaces where you open up a, a wall and it becomes a an even bigger space. Um, mm -hmm. It was one we did for a, for a, a very large UK government uh, customer that was, it was actually creating an environment so that they could meet safely in the same building in two different rooms. And it was, it was interview rooms. So effectively we created two different video booths that were securely connected together tamper proof so that you know that, that uh, nothing untoward could happen and absolutely bulletproof in terms of the technology to make sure that it actually worked first time every time and you know that was a, a massive success they, they needed a, a way to to get the the interviewers and the interviewees to meet together without actually meeting you know in the same in the same location so they could do it safely that was you know a real game changer i think Huh. That's that's one example of a of a, a a strange new kind of space that we're seeing. Yeah, that's really interesting. One of the uh, um, Zach, what about on your side? Are, are you guys seeing anything in terms of yeah, yeah orders or I, you know? I think it's yeah. it's still a little bit early days, uh, at least from our perspective. Um, I think on, on more of the software side, but I, I think what I've kind of just seen uh, throughout across the industry is. Uh, when you think of one, one of the areas where we've been impacted as a business, obviously, is we used to go to a lot of trade shows, uh, a lot of conferences, and those things have all become virtual events. Uh, customer visits, right? Uh, actually bringing your products to go and show to the customer, bring your customers on site. All of that has been disrupted. And so I think one of the possible uh, evolutionary uh, elements we'll see within office spaces is how do you create showrooms, uh, showrooms that are beneficial for customers coming on site, but also optimized for kind of virtual um, kind of customer visits. And I think there's some really interesting opportunities to transform that current office space to, to different use cases. I mean, I think some uh, larger organizations have, you know, they have learning and development areas, which are more classroom based. I think you could see that evolution happening where learning and development will have its own space with its own unique set of technology to ensure uh, that you, you, know, you might not need to bring 100 folks on site for kind of new hire training or sales kickoff, things like that. And so how can you think about leveraging that existing office space, which now you're not going to have as many designated workstations and thinking about the use cases and thinking about how you can apply technology to help really uh, emphasize those learnings and the things that you're trying to highlight in the virtual setting uh, as well as the physical setting. So, you know, I think it, it is more of a a pivot we're going to see to doing some discovery. And I think, you know, facilities managers have always been thinking about, well, what is the type of work that these employees need to get done? I think we're going to see that evolve to the next degree, which is, okay, how can we make these, these, these spaces even more specialized uh, to really help our teams get the most when they're either in the office or when they're dialing in to a more virtual experience? So I think there's a lot of work to be done there, but getting a little bit more granular uh, I think is probably one of the directions we'll see. Yeah, gotcha. A lot of a lot of um, little 
little spaces that weren't meeting areas that are that are just popping up all over the place. There's always been this, you know, if you if you look in, you know, sort of big multi-use spaces, sometimes there's furniture that's that's designed to acoustically shield stuff. You got two sofas with, you know, six foot backs and kind of really wrap around stuff to try and keep the sound in those in those areas. Well, these these spaces are becoming, you know, audio and video enabled in a lot of cases as well, you know, creating this this as you said we're just having the desks or reducing the number of desks, making them farther apart. That's one way. They're all all hot desk spaces rather than Scott's desk and so so and so's. Um, but also these other meeting spaces that just just weren't there before are all just popping up out of the blue now. And I think really, just one other well, to say one other yeah. point on that was what's interesting is you know. Traditionally, when you think of conference room systems for video conferencing, they were kind of these more large, cumbersome, kind of multi-component. And the, the sheer innovation that we've seen over the past year, where you have smaller devices, all-in-one devices uh, that have both audio and video capabilities that are more plug and play. I mean, these things are designed so that if you need to outfit an entire office space to make it video connected, it's going to be as easy as snapping your fingers. And that mm -hmm. technology, is it's not just about having the hardware, but some of just the, the software software elements of what those devices are doing in terms of the audio fencing, in terms of kind of the intelligent scene framing. I mean, it's going to be awesome. I think the, the future yeah. of our audio video experiences, when we have kind of this technology uh, built up throughout the workspaces, it's going to it's going to provide a very different experience than, you know, everyone just going into one conference room yeah. uh, and using the remote control to try to join a meeting. It's uh, we're going to see, I think, in the next few years, some pretty cool innovation. Yeah, I definitely agree there. So, Randy, is it, as a Microsoft MVP, what are what are you hearing from IT admins um, as they're considering the next phase of using Microsoft Teams for collaboration? So, the, the the first consideration when everybody got sent home was, oh crap, <laughs> my PBX or telephone <laughs> system in the office. Uh, if if the people just take their phone home, it isn't going to work. They're just they're, they're going to plug it in, and it's just not going to connect to anything. So they all needed to, a way to uh, to work from home effectively using the same numbers they already had. A lot of them used call diverts as a temporary measure, but you know we we, we saw projects that were slated to take a year being done in you know fifteen weeks. You know that kind of thing. They had to accelerate, and even it even quicker. There was there was one for a government agency that that we spoke to on the Monday, they placed the order on the Wednesday and they needed to be up and running by the Monday, the following <laughs> Monday. Um, it, it didn't happen. It took a, a couple of weeks after that, but you know, we moved mountains and they moved mountains to make sure everything worked and, and, and got in. So, you know, so IT is, is trying to, to shoehorn in a technology that they were already using and voice enabling it and they're, they're reaping the benefits from it. Um, the rest of it is, you know, using other, other facilities, other third-party services, or actually making use of all the technology in Microsoft 365, you know, power apps and power, you know, sort of the power platform to try and build, you know, line of business apps that actually help return to the to the office safely, um, you know, sort of booking a desk, that kind of thing. I mean, we developed one internally for a couple of a couple of um, um, companies that, that were that were rolling out. And, you know, it started with, you know, just find a desk from a list right through to now it's, you know, actually helping the people actually get back into the office safely and, and self-certify, agreeing to terms and conditions, as I said before, and, and everything in between, really. So it's, um, you know, having to adapt to all that technology is, is incredible. And also just using the technologies built into teamed rooms in general. So, you know, the camera technology is is um, is catching up in a big way. They all have brains, you know, the cameras themselves, so they can count the people in the office and actually alert when there's, you know, too many people in a, in a space. You know, mm -hmm. so you can set that limit. So if you've got a 12-person boardroom that really during, you know, social distancing can only take six, then you want to be be assured that everybody's going to be safe in that and actually alert somebody, you know, to make sure that everybody's safe in the whole thing. So there's there's so many different things that are that are coming that are that are helping things along. And, you know, these are these are technologies that just weren't even conceived of before the pandemic. Um, and, and they're just they've just come to fruition and just popped up out of nowhere, which is brilliant. 
Yeah, you know, it's, I'm I'm interested in in the reaction of, of both of you. You know, being you know heavily involved in in the Teams world. You know, just you know, just yesterday, um, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, you know, during the earnings call, said that there were now 145 million daily active users of Teams, and I think that was up from. Oh, I don't know what it was in November. It was 115 uh, million. Um, I think it was September, oh, right. September like in October. October. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. but even like the previous year, you know, the yeah. numbers were um, 75, know, yeah. 19, 19 million or something like in, in 19 in the summer uh, in 2019, yeah. you know, before the pandemic. It's just, I mean, it's been such an explosion. Um, you know, just any reactions to, uh, you know, to the adoption and, and sort of like where you're seeing the platform um, compared to what you would hope that it would be um, a couple of years ago. Yeah. When you think back, I mean, Teams is only four years old. We're four yeah. and a bit now. I think it was in, pro in private preview for a little while and then public preview for a couple of months before it went GA. And when it went GA, yeah. it really didn't do a lot. It was, you know, it was a, you know, there was promise. Obviously there was, it could do, you know, it was promised that it could do something. And over time it's, you know, they've added, you know, something like a thousand features over that space of time. So the, the amount of technology and innovation that's gone into it is, you know, I guess it had to, you know, they released what they call the MVP or the minimum viable product um, to the world and everybody saw some promise in it and, and kind of went along for the journey and it started to grow really steadily anyway. But then, you know, you just said 19 million becomes 40 million, 40 million becomes 75 million at the beginning of last year and this is you know just before all the lockdowns and the pandemics and this the, the fact that it's doubled in usage in that one in that one year period is just testament to you know everybody's i say everybody a lot of people have microsoft 365 licensing and teams is just one of those things that bundled in with it so right. it's one of those one of those no-brainers you know do you want to pay for your chat platform? Do you want to pay for your meetings platform? Do you want to pay for your telephone system? Or do you just want to use something you already own, voice enable it, and get rid of all that other legacy stuff? And and that's just you know what people have, have done out of necessity, but also just people wanted to do it anyway. Um, but you think about another use case, it's not just people in an office, it's education. Education has helped teams become you know, as as big as it is, you know, my both my daughters were homeschooling for, you know, two different lockdowns or three different lockdowns. And for both of them, they were using teams for their for their school lessons and stuff. And I thought it was, you know, really, really good. You know, imagine a teacher or an IT person at a school, you know, very underfunded, very small school with perhaps 600 students trying to figure out how to to navigate and get teams into you know all the classes for all the different years and all that kind of stuff so that you know sort of shout out to all the the educators out there that have actually just adapted and got this stuff moving with the help potentially of you know it it companies or uc companies and things like that but just you know the growth is is it's good for good reason and also out of necessity it's really good yeah, to see I the growth I'm, I think, you know, personally, I feel it's a testament to kind of the, the customer responsiveness. If you look at the sheer innovation, and Randy mentioned it, maybe it's a thousand features that have come out, and it's the, those, those impactful features, and it, like true innovation that I think has excited the customer base. Uh, and as, you know, someone who's, you know, at a competitive video conferencing uh, solution, it, it is just incredible to see uh, how they've been able to accomplish so much and their dedication to delivering uh, some of those really helpful features. Uh, things like together mode, which, you know, I think are just uh, very innovative uh, and but incredibly useful in times like this where people are searching for, you know, different ways to engage with one another and feel connected. And so I think it's, it's been the feature development, but also I've also been impressed in some of the what I'd call thought leadership that Microsoft has also introduced in terms of meeting fatigue. They just published uh, a really interesting study where they put sensors on people's brains and they were looking at the impact of having breaks in between meetings. And, you know, when when those of us are in meetings back to back to back and you never have a chance to take a breath. Well, that actually increases stress and anxiety. And they were able to prove that based on some of the like behavioral science research they were doing. And so they're taking that and then they're building features to actually drive outlook to shorten meetings and create breaks yeah. to help people be more productive. So 
it, it's like, you know, they, they've done a lot in terms of getting the, the product where it needs to be. So it's good enough, but even better than that, it's, it's better than good enough. And they're using those insights to create new pathways for innovation. And so, I mean, the growth has been tremendous. I think the industry consolidation leads to a, a chunk of that, but it, it, people want to use it. And so you could have people being forced to use it, but there's shadow IT everywhere. But in this case, we're seeing continued growth. I think, you know, we'd seen that 115 million number a couple months back and, and we hadn't seen a report out. So to continue to see that kind of linear growth, um, I, I think it's a testament to what the team's done. And, you know, it's you're kind of in awe, <laughs> quite honestly, yeah. standing back and saying, that's a lot of people using that product yeah. and it's just four years old. So um, yeah. exciting to see, but also exciting to kind of like participate uh, in the conversation, of course. Yeah, just imagine as well that Microsoft, you know, had no idea the the, the growth was going to happen. Um, so they scaled the platform based on what they thought the usage might be, and they've had to increase capacity, you know, again and again and again and again. And not only there are they just incre increasing capacity to react to those numbers, they're also increasing the capacity to go way beyond it. So doing, you know, a twenty thousand person webinar in Teams is going to be possible soon. You know, that's that's staggering, you know, the amount. And really, I, I believe they could actually go further than that. There's just the number they've tested it up to um, to try and figure out the scale. And it's not just one webinar. These are, you know, 145 million daily active users. How many of those 20,000 user webinars could there be at any one time on, around the planet? You know, that. so shout out to Microsoft for actually just not only just innovating and, and keeping ahead of the uh, the curve in terms of features, you know, things like the meeting, you know, sort of the five minute warning. I love that one. The five minute countdown, your meeting is going to end in five minutes. And it's just this visual warning that's that's that says, right, I'm going to go and have a break in a minute or or something like that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, you know, on the topic of the of the, the the features, so let's talk a little bit about the aspects of the the collaboration tech stack that that IT admins need to consider as they're thinking of um, of a hybrid workforce. And Randy, maybe you could talk about some of the Microsoft Teams features, you know, and then and then Zach, you know, maybe you could follow up with some of the you know conference rooms and and office spaces kinds of considerations. But so I'll, I'll turn over to, to Randy first on that one. So if you think about the four main pillars of Microsoft Teams, you got chat, you've got um, uh, video, you've got calling, you know, whether it's internal calling or or you know, actual telephony phoning a mobile number or something. And then you've got what we call collaboration. Uh, collaboration is a much bigger piece than the other three. You know, the other three is, you know, there's chat platforms all over the place, WhatsApp and you know, Facebook Messenger and Skype, of course, and and lots of others besides. Um, there's lots of telephony platforms, lots of uh, meeting platforms, blue jeans, um, notwithstanding. And then, of course, you know, the, the collaboration stack also has some um, some chat functionality inside of Teams and channels. And you know, th for for that kind of collaboration, it's more of a rather than one to one or one to a couple, it's it's one to many you know it could be an org, org wide team it could be a team working on a specific project it could be you know made up of people internal to the business but also business guests outside you know it could be your customer your supplier it could be third party consultants or or anything and everything in between so it's it's really the the collaboration space is this you know is this um almost war room if you like for collaborating on a specific subject um, you know, so that's just the conversations tab. And then you've got files and file access. So, you know, you think about the way we used to access files. It was a file server in the corner. <clears throat> Eventually that evolved into online storage or cloud storage. And of course you've got SharePoint and other online, you know, sort of uh, data repositories that also have more in them, so intranet type places that also became a place to, to store files. Well, with Teams, you know, you, the files are there, and you don't really have to think about where they are. They're just there. Um, they happen to be in SharePoint. They happen to be, you know, in OneDrive if you're if you're using personal uh, files in your chats and things. So there's there's all that. And then of course you've got the the apps and the connectors. So connectors could be, you know, a connector to a Twitter feed. It could be a connector to another line of business app that that happens to have developed something that lives or that can live and integrate with Teams. Um, 
And then, and then of course, you just got apps themselves. So apps could be things like, you know, attendant consoles that could be, you know, um, other meeting platforms. It could be ways to to access a YouTube video or do a search for something, or even just, you know, integrating with third party services like Trello to do project management and stuff. So, you know, it's it's really this hub for teamwork, as they call it. It's a very cliched term, but it is that. And I'm not going to I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say the single pane of glass, but it is that that kind of that's that rectangle with which you look to uh, to do your work. Um, and I'll say rectangle, unless you've got a monitor that's uh, that's absolutely square, it's going to be a rectangle. So, I'll, uh, just in case everybody's throwing stuff at the uh, at the chat and the Q and A, um, the consider the top considerations really is about making sure that it works, making sure that people can actually collaborate and um, uh, with each other, but also then just do it safely. So you think about you know everybody in an office, you can see them. You're not necessarily walking around looking at everybody's screen to make sure they're they're doing things responsibly, but you know using technologies that are built in. Data loss prevention is one, um, you know, that that actually helps protect your your intellectual property, not just the files, but the things you say. You know, being able to to put a filter on you know, the chats to, to make sure that you don't say something out of turn or to flag something if, you know, somebody says Project Red Book or, uh, or, or something like that, Redstone, you know, sort of born identity type stuff, you know, and, and alerting the people that need to know that they're actually talking about that stuff. But also then just protecting, you know, for, for, for one is shadow IT, but also just making sure that, you know, the, the, the security that's built into the office stack can also be leveraged inside a team so that you can't just you know screenshot something and send it out or you can't just copy something to a cloud storage or a thumb drive or or something and actually get it out the building and that, that leaks don't happen you know there's there's a lot of technologies built into the background that, that you can actually leverage to protect the business from all sorts of things not least of which the internal staff who are probably one of the weakest links um, so that's a massive consideration. Uh, you know, we call it governance and just security in general. So I think that's the, that's the biggest one. And, then, and as I said, the you know, the next the secondary one is just making sure everybody can connect. And that's not just in an office. You know, resilient internet connections, that sort of thing. But imagine going home. You know, not everybody has very very fast broadband to where they are. You know, I know there was actually a, a, a guy that work that I work with that is on satellite broadband because that's what he can get where he's at. You know, very slow satellite broadband, and he he can't get 5G or anything. I think he's stuck on 4G, so his internet connection is just about good enough. But you know, he's always looking to technology to try to increase that, and but he still participates. You know, where, where he can. You know, that that's that's great to see. So connecting to technology, making sure it can be done safely and um, and securely, I think, are the the, the two main considerations. Um, it, for, okay. for the collaboration in general. Great, and uh, and Zach on the on the conference rooms and sort of mm -hmm. office spaces side of you know those those IT admins considerations. Um, yeah, I, I would I would I would pick up on yeah I would pick up on the same theme uh, that that Randy was uh, laying down, which is around connectivity, ease of use, uh, ensuring that when you have employees who may not be as familiar with the technology, that they're not going to struggle with it when they're in a conference room trying to join a meeting it can be a, a high stress event. Uh, you know, you're coming in, you might be running a minute late. The last thing you want to do is fumble around with remotes, plugging in cables, not being able to join the meeting, wasting everyone's time. And so when thinking about that end user experience, when thinking about the expectation, kind of like the consumerization of kind of IT, like those experiences in the conference room need to reflect experiences that we use in the rest of our our day-to-day -day kind of experiences. So I think ensuring that you've got your calendars all synced up uh, so it's easy to book a conference room space. That's kind of a no-brainer. But then also having kind of a two-tablet experience where you have kind of the outside of the room, which is highlighting whether a meeting is, is available, a meeting room is available, whether someone's in a meeting, really just kind of a visual indicator to understand, hey, is this a meeting space I can use, especially with the proliferation of meeting spaces that we're going to see in the office. Uh, it's going to be really important that you just have a good sense as an IT administrator like, that you're providing solutions that are available 
uh, or not available, and that there's easy visual indicators behind that. Uh, and then within the conference room itself, I think there's, uh, as we previously mentioned, there's a lot of existing hardware that's out there. You want to make sure that that is able to connect to your Microsoft Teams meetings. Uh, if you have huddle spaces or meeting spaces that aren't currently video enabled, you need to think through how do you bring the right technology uh, into each of those specific spaces that satisfies the appropriate requirements. Uh, and then, you know, another element that Randy mentioned earlier was kind of the magic whiteboard. I think that there's going to be kind of this interesting, I know I personally feel it. I wish I had a whiteboard here uh, at home. Uh, I wish I had a whiteboard that would easily kind of like tr transfer uh, into the digital, digital realm. Um, so I do think, especially as you have some people back in the office, people not in the office, you know, how are you going to be able to leverage those physical assets and uh, digitize them? Uh, so thinking through some of that, uh, those, those peripheral components, uh, I think will be important. I don't think, you know, you don't need to go crazy and outfit every room to the nines. You need to be diligent uh, and focus on what each meeting space will require for the type of work that is expected there uh, and just make, you know, make, make, the, make the right decisions for the meeting space. Um, so uh, I think we'll see a lot of that start to come together as these conference spaces uh, and meeting spaces begin to be outfitted. Yeah, and Zach, I guess as a follow up on that, how do how do companies ensure that their their offices are ready with with Microsoft Teams? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I mean, I think that it's one of the important things to do uh, within Microsoft Teams uh, is kind of understand the usage, and you know. I think it would be really important that as you start to bring folks back into the office, I mean, you're going to try to prepare yourself as much as you possibly can. And then the, the doors are going to open, employees are going to start coming back, and you'll, you'll get a real sense. Uh, so looking at some of those utilization metrics, understanding how many meetings are taking place, understanding, like Randy said, you've got some of those uh, analytics within the video conferencing systems themselves that will tell you how many people are in, in rooms, ensuring that you're following the right safety protocols, just really keeping a good eye on performance and you know are are some of those metrics that you were seeing previously in terms of adoption how are those shifting uh that's going to be i think one key indicator and then the second key indicator for any it person of course is how many times are we getting support tickets uh throughout the day <laughs> you know is is the technology working as intended or are people having a hard time figuring it out uh and so i think it, it's one of those things where you're going to you're going to prepare for the work that you expect, and then it's going to change. This, you know, once again, this is all about flexibility. This is the, the dynamicism of kind of the next generation of work. Um, but I don't think turning a blind eye to it, not managing it, uh, is going to have the best, uh, you know, outcomes. I think one of the really interesting other takeaways uh, that I saw from a recent Microsoft uh, piece of research is that, you know, not only do employees uh, expect flexibility, I think, going forward, but there's also something like 40% of employees that are thinking about changing jobs in the next year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like the pandemic has created this, this crazy time where everyone's kind of revisiting, hey, is this, is this the job that I want to do going forward? Um, and I think that what IT does to prepare the workspace for successful collaboration outcomes, for having kind of the right types of uh, work experiences in the office, I think that like you're going to have a better outcome when it comes to retention. And so mm -hmm. it's really important now that you think about the outcomes that you're trying to drive are not only oriented around productivity and ensuring that uh, on-site and remote employees are productive, but it's how are we building our workspace to retain those employees? Because people are kind of poking their head up right now and trying to figure out what's next. And if you have good, strong talent, you don't necessarily want them to walk out the door because your organization isn't adapting a lockstep. So I thought that was a really interesting finding, but I think it has important implications for how you think about outfitting your office going forward. I think that's a really important point. I, I was reading an article the other day about sort of, the, you know, some managers expecting a snapback situation where they're going to, you know, have everybody back in the office and be monitoring who's working, you know, by seeing their, their you, know, you know, seeing them in their seats. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there was a quote in there about, you know, corporations have 100 percent of the power. But I, I think you're raising a, a, a really important point is that a lot of people are going to be looking around and there are going to be a lot more companies that are open to working in the way that, you know, yeah. workers have come to, to find that they kind of like and they can work anywhere, you know, for mm -hmm. those employers. So, yeah, great points. Um, so 
Maybe I'll direct this one to uh, to Randy first, but how would an organization decide on whether to deploy new hardware um, or use CVI to use existing rooms? That's a that's a great question. So I guess it depends on, on budget for, for, for the start. You know, think about tr traditional legacy SIP and HRE23 rooms. Some of these rooms and systems that were there were, you know, were tens, hundreds of thousands, you know, back in the day, you know, and the considerations you had to connect to ISDN gateways and modems to try and do point to point links and all kinds of other stuff that, that really we don't need to, to mess with now. Um, and, you know, you, you usually want, when you buy a piece of technology, you want to sweat that asset for as long as you can to try and maximize the return on investment. So you're not going to just throw away something that costs you, you know, sort of many tens of thousands um, overnight. Um, so in those kind of cases where you do need to sweat that, maybe you're still paying an offer, just maybe you just don't want to do that, then technologies like CVI become your, your best friend, really. It means that you know for the spaces that that maybe you didn't have that that big an investment in, or for key rooms where you do need to make sure that it's you know maximizing on the team side and making it simple, you can upgrade those rooms. But those other spaces that you know maybe aren't as 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 important, or you just as I said, you just don't want to give them up, then CVI becomes that um, that that lifeline. Um, and I always say, you know, even if you don't use CVI for, for bringing your own legacy equipment in, you know, always have some in the bank for that eventuality that, you know, you don't know what your customers are going to join your meeting with. You know, if they want to sit in their boardroom with their Cisco or their something else, let them and show them that, that as a benefit. You know, you're thinking about not only your employees and everybody else, but you're thinking about your customers, your partners and that sort of thing. So just always have some CVI in the bank. And, you know, it's, it's obvious when you send out a Teams meeting invite, it always has that, you know, join join Teams meeting here, maybe a phone number below that. And below that is, you know, here's a friendly link for for getting in no matter what you've got. And, I, and I'm, I'm extending that to you as a benefit. So, yeah, I mean, you don't have to go hog wild. I mean, somebody used the term, you don't have to go, go hog wild when it comes to all this technology in, in your rooms. Um, by all means, if you if you do need to, you know, there's the technology that's available is, is absolutely incredible that you can you know bring in ceiling tile mics and the cameras that follow you around as you walk around the space and pace up and down and all that kind of stuff but you know and even with all that you can make it simple you walk in press join and you're in and that's the key you know nobody's fumbling with a remote nobody's grabbing cables and plugging it into something figuring out what source the tv has to be on and all that kind of stuff everything has to be geared to be simple whether it's you know using your existing kit into a teams meeting or whether you're using you know team specific hardware or whether you're just you know using it as a bring your own space to just present something from a from a supplier's laptop on the screen in the room you know it just needs to be really really simple Zach anything to to add to that I think Randy nailed it um what I would <laughs> what I would say is you know the some of that legacy hardware that organizations do have sitting around the cameras are great you know the audio generally speaking is top notch and so just because maybe it's not the latest and greatest doesn't mean it's still not a very high performance system you know some of these systems are ten thousand dollars if not more and so i would i would really think about how can you maximize the utility uh, of those devices but also you know with a forward-looking eye um you know what where, where can you maybe bring in some of those microsoft team rooms to help complement that those existing systems that you have so uh but no great job randy that was an awesome response <laughs> pleasure great well let's uh let's uh jump over to some questions from the audience uh, I guess the, the first thing I should point out is that that uh, Andy um, appreciated the Randy your shout out to uh, education IT and what what an amazing job they did with uh, with teams over the last year um, we've got another question here uh, for small business um, what's the best way to make sure the office is ready we're trying to prioritize different projects um, any prioritization guidance as we try to bring people to the office um, Zach, I'll, I'll direct that to you. Any, any thoughts on that one? So I think that, you know, once again, it, it kind of ties back to the, the type of work that needs to get done. And I'd say that if, if 
you know, the type of work that needs to get done is more collaborative in nature. Um, you know, I, I would start to think through what the game plan looks like to bring folks back and ensuring that you've got not only uh, kind of the right safety measures to keep everyone safe and protected, but also thinking through the technology stack uh, to make sure that you can uh, have some folks, you know, on site and some folks remotely. So, you know, I guess I, I would revert back to just thinking through what are we trying to accomplish? I think as, as Randy said, uh, which was interesting, is that, you know, there's there's come some restrictions in place where teams are coming on site, but they're not there for five days a week. They're there for maybe an hour at a time. Um, so just really having a disciplined plan to what are we going to accomplish in that time? Let's make sure that if we need to have technology built into support us during that point in time. Let's have that. Um, but let's not overthink it. Let's try to take maybe just some small steps to get us back into a place where everyone's feeling comfortable, going to be productive, uh, and then move forward from that. So um, I guess that would be my guidance. Okay, super. All right. Um, well, I just wanted to move to, uh, you know, there's a there's a, a call to action slide, um, and uh, Zach, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to, to say about that one, um, about what's on yeah, there. Sure. So um, for those folks uh, who have joined us today who are interested in learning a little bit more about CVI, about cloud video interop, uh, we do offer the BlueJeans Gateway for Microsoft Teams. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can actually experience the BlueJeans Gateway. We have a free 30-day trial uh, where you can connect your room systems and have as many meetings as you'd like for those 30 days. If you aren't ready to take that step, we have something called a test drive where effectively we'll send your conference room system an invite to join a four-hour exploding meeting, but at least it's a proof point that shows that we can connect to 19,000 different room system configurations, and you'll get that that legacy uh, SIP or H.323 endpoint to connect to a Teams meeting. Uh, and just to learn more, we've got some information there uh, in terms of our, our website and some of the collateral and other information uh, that everyone can check out. And if you do have a specific question around our cloud video interrupt solution, feel free to uh, reach out to us through that link, and we'll get back to you uh, and, and help you on your journey. Very cool. What's what's an exploding meeting then? Is it what's so that it's really to? just a four hour meeting, you know, where we are yeah. going to send a calendar invitation. It's good for four hours for you to join uh, from from any really endpoint that you uh, you add yeah. to the meeting invitation. And then that four hour window closed. We call it an exploding meeting because it's kind of time bound. Um, but it's a, it's a great way to join like the old spy uh, teams messages. meeting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like Inspector Kanaji, you know, where it explodes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it makes okay. it a little more fun. So it's it's kind of to dip your toes, and then if you want to go all in, uh, the free trial and everything is accessible online. There's a four step wizard. Super easy to get going. Uh, it's a great experience. Super. Well, we're we're up on time, so I just want to you know see if you guys have any sort of closing thoughts. Um, and uh, Randy, I'll go to you first, and then and then uh, and then Zach second. Closing thoughts. Yeah, I mean, just, I, I'd say you know follow the guidance in uh, in your local vicinity. You know, do make sure you do things safely. Make sure you do things responsibly. Um, you know, get your vaccination if if, if that's your thing. Um, <laughs> wear a mask. <laughs> I'd say definitely, <laughs> without question, wear a mask wherever you happen to be. You know, it's, we're not we're not out of the woodworks, and uh, we're not going to be for probably a little while. But you know, do everything as best you can. If you are going back into the office, you know, baby steps as you said, but just think about why you need to be there, why everybody else needs to be there, and fit things out in a in a way that that helps really everybody, and and it can be done responsibly. Um, and then just you know. As uh, as they said on, uh, um, just be good to each other, isn't it? <laughs> or be excellent to each other, isn't it? Bill and Ted, there you go. Bill and Ted, be excellent. <laughs> yeah, I think that that was it. Yeah. <laughs> I would um, I would echo that. I would echo the Bill and Ted comment, uh, and I'd also say, you know, think think about the people, think about the people before the technology, and think about yeah. how your your plan uh, is going to be about supporting your employees and understanding the type of work that they're hoping to get done, and then using that as a roadmap to build out. Uh, kind of the technology infrastructure that you required. But I think if we start with the people as we enter this kind of next generation of, of hybrid work, uh, we're going to be more successful than if we just try to throw a bunch of tools and technology at it. So that's, but, but be excellent to each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great, that's a great place to end it. Uh, you know, both of you guys uh, focusing on the people and, uh, and be excellent to each other. So 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Zach. Thanks, Randy, uh, for being with us today. It was, it was uh, really good stuff. Um, My pleasure. And also want to thank the audience for uh, for attending. And uh, in this this uh, webcast was sponsored by Blue Jeans and presented by Redmond Mag. Have an excellent day. Take care.